Okay, y'all. So thanks for coming out. I'm super excited to be here. I always really enjoy being able to get up and give people an hour of my brain. I know that you're only going to remember 30% of what I say because of the adult learning theory, but I'm up for the challenge. Um, we also have some friendly people online watching us right now. Woo! Right? So, um, you know, I see you out there in online land. Um, so my name is Dr. Jennifer Benjamin. A lot of people locally call me Jen Ben. I don't know if you've heard of me or not. Um, I have my PhD in industrial and organizational psychology. Fancy way of saying workplace psychology, right? Um, so I focus on evidence-based practices in the workplace as well as in therapy. I'm certified in trauma therapy. I'm a state trainer for um, family-based services that focuses on children in crisis who are at risk of being taken out of the home. And I'm also trained in dialectical behavioral therapy and had a startup program for about seven years. Um, so I'm currently, since 2014, I've been with Cornerstone Therapy and Wellness. And at Cornerstone, we actually have two sites. We have one in Wayne and one in Malvern. We offer therapists, psychologists, dietitians, adult psychiatry. And with um, our staff, we're providing individual uh, family therapy, testing and assessment, um, health and wellness, and group therapy. And we see all ages, children to aging adults. And in the, for the group therapy, we have a woman's recovery group. We have a DBT skills group for teens. It's not a comprehensive program. It's a skills supplement for teens 13 to 18 who are in individual therapy for a while, but they don't seem to be progressing at the pace that they want to. And um, we have an adult triage skills groups. It's an eight week group. So adults who've been in therapy and again, they feel like they need some extra skills to boost themselves. We have that program available as well. Yes. Oh, thanks for asking. I know, I'm like throwing these abbreviations around. It's called dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, it's a very skills focused, not a process group where we're actually teaching people how to bring them, like mindfully bring themselves back into the present moment, tolerate distress, regulate their emotions, manage relationships. Those things that seem difficult to teach people how to do uh, we break them down and teach them how to do those more difficult steps that they see other people doing and they don't seem to know how to do it for themselves. And then finally, we have the parent group uh, that I might run, I don't know, right? Um, and then we also have the Cornerstone Wellness Institute where we do mindfulness training, uh, speaking sessions, we do other forms of training depending on the organization's need, and we also do evidence-based coaching. So Cornerstone offers a vast array of things. If you, here's the number, but we also have a website. And here's my email, Jen Ben, see that? Consulting. Okay, so we are gonna talk about parenting tonight. I'm a parent too. Parenting is really hard. I know that, and we don't have to be perfect. And you know, if you're like me, you want a couple things in life. You wanna win the lottery. You also would like your kids to be well behaved. You want them to be successful. You want them to be able to learn how to manage their emotions. And you know, in doing that, we have to learn how to parent intentionally. We have to learn how to be brave when we're parenting, and we have to learn how to be strategic. But, you know, because there's no manual for this, that can be a little challenging. So I'm gonna tonight work with you on being aware of what is happening that parenting gets so critical, right? Um, what occurs in that parent-child interaction? I'm gonna work with you on trying to accept that, but I'm also, no smoke and mirrors, going to give you skills to use when you walk away from here. Come on, people. 
really? You're going, like, listen, there's somebody standing up here, right? And I'm not even faking. I'm actually going to give you things to walk out of here, actionable things that you're going to be able to go home. And then you're going to be like, kid's going to come up to you. And you're going to be like, boom, drop the skill. And be like, what? <laughs> and then you're going to like text your friends and be like, oh my God, you missed Jen Ben. Her, her stuff really works. I know, right? Oh, sorry, they should have been here. So, um, but the sad thing is, I only get to talk for an hour, and I know you're going to want more. I already know that. Um, and that's why y'all should email me then and come to my parent group. Because then I can just enrich your lives and help you change your child's life. And it's real. That's what happens. Okay? So... I believe that there are two reasons, two major challenges to parenting. The first one is that we have this fast-paced, judgmental world that we live in. And, you know, one piece to this fast-paced world is it's part of social psychology. That, you know, we see something we're not familiar with and then it's this thing called attributes, right? So all this really means is if, if you and I were friends, and you were like, oh my gosh, ask me how that movie was. Go ahead. How was that movie? Oh my gosh, it's like if Home Alone was a musical. It was so fun, right? And now you instantly have this vision of what this movie looks like, what the emotional experience is going to be, because I attributed it to something that's familiar to everybody, right? So we do this very quickly. When things happen, we start attributing what something is and try to make it familiar and something we've gone through. But the other part about this um, fast-paced, judgmental world we live in is we really become unaware of it until we get smacked with it. So I'm driving down 202 in King of Prussia, right? And has anybody ever driven in the King of Prussia Mall during rush hour? It's so enjoyable. And I was with my partner, Pilar, from Argentina. We did in-home crisis therapy together. And we had to merge from the mall onto 202, which, and you know, we're already late because we had to make a Wawa stop and, you know. So this really nice truck, like small truck drive, like a smaller medium truck, lets us in. I'm like, oh my gosh, how nice is that? That is so nice. So the traffic moves, we get over in our lane, and his truck moves up, and I go, oh, do you see that? He's got one of those stickers, like 1-800-HOW'S-MY-DRIVING, right? And it's got his like number 56C9er on it. And I go, I'm going to call, and I'm going to give that guy a compliment. I'm doing it, right? And my friend Pilar's like, yeah, let's do it. So we call, you know get my phone out, give them a call. And they're like, hello, 1-800-COMPLAINT. And I'm like, yes, I would like to give blah, blah, blah driver a compliment. And they go, what? <laughs> I go, yes, I, I have a compliment. <laughs> and I, I remember this so vividly. She goes, no, what's your complaint? <laughs> and I go, no, I want to give a compliment. She goes, I'm going to have to patch you through to a supervisor. <laughs> and I was like, so Pilar's looking at me, and she's like, what's going on? She's like, eating this look. And I'm like, they won't take the compliment. And she's like, oh, you Americans, right? Because she's from Argentina, and she always would get mad. She'd be like, how are you doing? And I go, good, great. And she's like, you don't mean that. That's not how we should talk to each other. She always thinks we're fast-paced and moving through things. So I get through to the supervisor, and at this point, she's already laughing. And I said, OK, I'm giving this guy a compliment. And, she goes, and they're like, what happened? I said, he let us in. It was wonderful. And we were going to be late, and blah, blah, blah. And they go, I can't help you. Our, we don't have a form for that. I was like, well, and I'm, you know, because the people who know me, I was like, well, just take the form, cross out, complain at the top, write compliment. You know, I'm like telling the guy how to do his job. And he's like, I really can't help you. And I'm like, and then I'm like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> but, at, you know, when that happened and through my training, I realized that this is really 
how you know the world works right we audit and look for the mistakes at work you know we're always like what did we do wrong but we're not looking at what we're doing well right we're not looking at what's working so and I'm really visual so in my mind this is how I took the criticalness, this fast-paced critical world, and we're like, judge, make a decision, move, go. You know, This is how I take it and think about it. So let's say we take a scale 0 to 10. And we decide 10 is everything that's good that happens, or let's, let's do it, let's say it. Perfect. Ooh. But nobody has to be perfect. Right. OK. And then let's go with 0 and say that's bad. You know, very judgmental of us, good and bad. So now, from 0 to 10, there are actually numbers in between here. Do people know that? 0 to 10, right? OK. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So what happens in our society is we say anything from a 9 over actually gets deemed as wrong. That's how we work in society. We don't give credit to all of these, these pieces moving towards being good or perfect. You either nailed it, you either got 100, or you didn't. You either did what I asked you to do or you didn't. And so we start, not only does society around us do this, but then as parents, we start doing this as well. So in our heads, we go, oh, it's like this. Or we go, oh, this is what it needs to look like. You're not doing it, so it's wrong. And instead, what we really need to start doing in order to manage being in such a critical society that's so fast moving because of the internet and social media and instant gratification, we need to start looking at that everything outside of zero is actually progress. It's actually effort. So when we're going through our examples today and talking about skills, to me, what I'm looking at is trying to encourage us to start seeing what change is happening in front of us instead of, in our mind as a parent, having this vision of what our child has to be doing or should be doing, or Sally's kid does this, so my kid needs to do it too. And instead of that, letting that go and being able to look at the progress that our individual child is making. So the other really interesting part, right, the second part to challenging the challenge of parenting is emotions. Ooh, right? Does everybody have emotions? That was not a trick question. Yeah, sometimes I ask questions, people are like, do we? Do we have emotions? So the first emotion that's part of parenting is shame. So shame occurs when we think we're being reminded of a wrong we've committed or that we messed up our parenting again. Wow, we've got a lot of perfect parents in here. Okay. Or shame happens when we think our integrity is being attacked, when we're not good enough. The second emotion that happens is fear. So fear occurs when we feel panicked, afraid, terrified, um, we don't know how to manage a situation. So I'm in the middle of CVS. My daughter throws herself on the middle of the floor. Panic ensues, right? Because I don't know why she's on the floor, but I know she's screaming. And I know there's people watching. <laughs> there's some shame for you. And that would be when the shame and the panic both kick in at the same time. So then we get to feel criticized and we get to feel afraid. So now we're looking at that effort doesn't exist, right? And then we have our emotions pop up. And so what happens as a result is we cover our shame and our panic in these moments with anger. So it's 
What they found in the research is that when humans feel a habitual emotional pattern over and over again, and as parents frequently we feel shame and we feel fear, we will cover it with an emotion. For example, anger. We get angry about being afraid and shamed. So this combination of motion exists. Whether your kid has mental and behavioral health challenges or not, when we parent, this happens for everybody. So, and here's the thing, the first thing you need to remember. Okay, everybody listening? Here's part of your 30%. Emotions are not bad. It's the behaviors that happen because of intense emotions that take us further away from meeting our goals. Everybody has emotions. It's a primal form of communication. They are not a bad thing, but we get taught that if we can't control our emotions perfectly, if we can't make ourselves look like everybody on social media, that we're bad and we're wrong. And so then it, it all plays into this critical thinking. Okay, so what I'm doing so far is I'm mapping out what's happening in parenting that it becomes critical. Emotion and the way society pushes us to be perfect and not acknowledge effort. Touch your nose, and those of you at home do it too, if you got it. You get it? Touch your nose, touch your nose. Oh, oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, good. Okay, great. So, I have come up with several examples for you of what this looks like then, right? So great, I gave you the psychological part, all the pieces, and now I'm gonna give you some real live examples. And then, after the examples, I'm gonna give you a skill to use, right? Because then when I say the example and you're like, oh, that happens to me, or I do a little bit of that, but my spouse does that, everybody can point at their spouse and go, you writing that down, <laughs> right? Um, so I'm gonna start with one of my favorite stories. So years ago, I um, had a client who came in with her mother, and the problem behavior was door slamming. Now this happens, right? Slam the door. Now, in this case, it was the most door slamming I had ever experienced in a case, right? There's first for everything. And this client door slammed like 150 times per an episode. I'm not making this up, it's true. So, and our goal became to work on moving from 150 to, I mean, preference of zero, right? I mean, that would be my goal. So just to like bring it down a notch, right? I'm gonna use a little bit of different numbers. So let's say you have a door slammer and they slam the door 10 times, right? When they're slamming it. And then let's say we're gonna try to get to five door slams and then we're gonna try to get to zero door slams and then we're gonna try to get to no door slamming and them using their words. Ooh, wouldn't that be exciting, right? And then, because we're overachievers, we're gonna get to no door slamming words and they're gonna process their emotions. That's so exciting, right? So, right, when they get to their 10, they're gonna go, Oh, mother, I felt like slamming the door, and I didn't, so I used a skill. I'm having some anger. <laughs> right? Because that's what we want our children to be able to do in our fantasy, right? <laughs> that's what you all are thinking in that moment. But we don't realize how silly it is until I say it out loud. Okay. So here's what happens, though. So the parent goes, my kid slams the door 10 times every time blah, blah, blah happens. I don't want them to slam the door at all. And I go, oh my gosh, that's such a great vision. I really agree with you. That's excellent. And I go, okay, it's a process. We got to work through this. And we got to start seeing the effort. So the kid comes into session the next week and I go, 
How, how'd you do? And they go, well, Jen, I only slammed the door five times. I, oh my gosh, that's incredible. How did you do that? You must have done something so skillful, right? And, you know, but I'm not new at this, so I saved 10 minutes at the end of session and walked the kid out because I know the parent's going to want to talk to me. Yeah. And um, so I've just praised the kid. I'm like, this is awesome. You know, we figured out they used a skill they didn't know they were using. And I come out, and the parent's like, can I talk to you? I said, absolutely. Come on back. So they come back. They're slamming the door. They've been with you one week, and they're not fixed, and they're slamming the door. And I go, well, but would you agree? You know, Johnny said he only slammed the door five times. And they go, well, yes. And I go, isn't that unbelievably amazing? And they usually, <laughs> they go, I thought you knew what you were doing. <laughs> and I go, well, wait, I do, look. So from here to here is a 50% improvement. And in the world of psychology, right, if we were doing statistics, a 20% improvement is considered astronomically amazing. And this is more than double, right? So is that a change? Yeah. So did something with effort happen? Right. But as parents, we want this. I want it too. Trust me. I want it too. I get it. But if we don't, the laws of behaviorism tell us that if we don't acknowledge the, the change in the effort that's making, then we won't be able to maintain this on purpose. If our kid does this, it would be an accident, and they wouldn't know how to maintain it on purpose. So we can actually focus on going from 10 slams to 5, and then to 0, which is 100% improvement. Oh my gosh, that's five times of astronomical. That's huge. And we can then work our way to adding in other capacities. But that requires us to start looking at things as if there's progress and effort instead of seeing this is all wrong. OK? So the first skill is that you have to start seeing the effort. You have to get out of the fantasy of what you want your child to do. It's great to have a vision. I'm all about it. But we have to be realistic about how we're going to get there if we want the progress to sustain itself. Now, I know this is hard to do, so I'm going to tell you the cheat for it. That's not exciting? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, ooh, what is it, Jen Ben? Right? Well, they found out that when you start practicing skills for yourself as a parent, it actually is much easier to use them with your child in that parent-child relationship. So if you would like to start to be able to acknowledge the effort in your child's behavior, the secret is start acknowledging your own effort. Right? So if you're able to do something like classic, oh, this is a classic one, right? You know, that go, I'm going to the gym seven days a week, two hours at a time. And if I don't, it's a failure, right? So maybe you make it twice that week. Be like, good job. That's effort. Because the week before, you didn't go at all because you were too shamed and feared and angry. It's like I know what I'm talking about. Do you get that sense? <laughs> right? OK. So what we need to do is start working on acknowledging effort and what we're doing and how we're making change and progress at home, at, you know, at work, in the community, and then we actually will be able to more easily apply that in our relationship when we're seeing our child's behavior. We'll be able to catch that one thing that went different and see that effort, okay? So that's your first skill. See the effort. Yes? yes. Touch your nose if you got it. Ooh, that was a quick nose touch. That's good. Our brains are going. Okay, so next example. Now, most kids have some annoying or disruptive behavior, right? I know mine does. Several. 
You know, it could be the one where it's like up under you, like get up, what? move, move away. You're in my face, mommy doesn't like it. Move away from me, right? Could be those. Or, you know, the, where you're like, what do you want for dinner? Ah! You know, and like the T-Rex comes out of your child just because you wanted to know what they wanted for dinner. Those things happen. So, you know, let's say you're doing your thing and you realize all of a sudden your brain goes, oh no, that's going to trigger my child and that annoying behavior of theirs that's disruptive is going to happen. And then the moment hits and it didn't happen. And you're like, that's awesome. It didn't happen. And it's like, ah, uh -huh. it's just, you're like, I want to have a moment of silence for this moment of amazingness. And it's a relief. It's like all of a sudden you came up for air from drowning in the ocean and the world is a perfect place and it's fantastic, right? Yeah, everybody, yes, see, everybody, see you get the bobblehead, like, right? Um, but then, 20 minutes later, of course, the child does that annoying and disruptive behavior that they didn't do. And because they did it, all of the previous progress is annihilated. And we kibosh it, and it no longer exists. And we go from like, wow, that was a great moment, to, oh my gosh. The, they never do it right. They always, they're torturing me. I can't believe it. Why do they do this to me? And we, that, and then we take it personal. Right, has anybody ever taken it personal? Yes, like every day, right? So what, you know, I mean, we did what we all do in that moment. We go like, oh, so all the progress that happened is completely gone. And, and so what we have to do in those moments is start teaching ourselves. Here's our first skill in this example. Everybody ready? Imaginary seatbelt. Right? What we have to do is start being more precise when we think about these moments. Right? So my child, oh no, all these people up here, I'm going to start like, they're going to be like, I wish I didn't sit here. <laughs> right? So my child does their annoying and disruptive thing, and I go, you always blah, 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 and you never da, 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 da. Now, always and never are very strong words, because always means 100%, and never means zero. Okay? Does everybody agree with that? Yes? Okay. So, and you know why I find this? This is so entertaining when this happens, right? Because then people come up to me, and they go, my child accuses me of always grounding them, and that's not true. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder where they learned to do that. Where did they learn to use such strong language like always and never? I can't imagine how that happened, right? So what we want to be able to do in that moment is to say, sometimes, frequently, like I have a great example. It actually happened this morning. And I was like, oh, it's so exciting. I can use an example. Hopefully my daughter's not watching. <laughs> OK, so I don't remember all the details, right? But it was one of those where like, I woke up with a foot in my face this morning, and it was my child's. And I was like, what? What's going on? And we were like, she's getting dressed, and we're talking. And um, I felt the always and never coming out of my soul. I was like, you oh. And I stopped myself. And I was like, ooh, I'm going to be skillful. And I was like, you know, about two to three times a week, I wake up with your foot in my face. And you know what she did? She goes, that's right, Mommy. <laughs> and then we could talk about it. Because I didn't say, you always put your foot in my face every morning. And that's not true. Nuh uh. And I go, yeah, ha. Huh? Right? You ever had one of those arguments? <laughs> those are good ones, right? You, those can go on for like, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. Those are great. The nuh uh, yeah, ha huh ones, those are fun. Okay. <laughs> So, okay, so that's part of it, right? We have to be more precise. And the other part of this, oh, this is a good one. If you don't remember anything else when you leave here tonight, put this one in your soul forever. Okay, is everybody ready? Okay, so we have to connect and then correct. <laughs> 
Do you like that rhyme? It's got a little flow. Maybe not a rhyme, but a flow. So you got to connect and then correct. Now, the magic word being and. So I go up to my child and I say, I come home from work. I go to my child. Child, you took the trash out, but you forgot the recycling. Ooh. Does anybody feel that? It's like a, like I'm acknowledging you, but I'm annihilating my acknowledgement and then sticking it to you anyways. <laughs> right? Right? Good job, but. So instead, what I want to be able to do is connect and acknowledge and then correct the situation. So I would go up to my kid and go, hey, Sally, took the trash out and you forgot the recycling. Can we get that out there? Did anybody catch that? That just changed your life right there, right? So imagine emails, how much we go, but, right? Or with our bosses, or with people we interact with, significant, important people in our life. And we want to be able to connect and acknowledge effort and then ask them to complete and finish what they need to do, right? So what I say in parent group, just to give you a little taste of how amazing it is, I'll go, don't use the word but. Butts are stinky. And then people remember it. So now every time you say the word but, you'll see me going, butts are stinky. Right? Use the word and. It's a really fun game. When you leave here for the next week, only use the word and. And what happens is you're talking to people and you go, blah, 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 but, uh, uh, and. And, and. And then you'll start getting it. But people are like, whoa, what's wrong with her? Right? Or you'll be yelling at your kid, and you'll be like, but, I mean, and. <laughs> and I practice these things. My husband's probably watching, which is a little unfortunate, because if I end up talking about him, then he'll know. <laughs> but he'll say to me, are you using a skill again? And I'm like, yes, I have to practice what I preach. It's very important. Right? OK. so. Everybody got that one? Be precise. Use the word and. Butt stink. OK. Next thing, parents and Johnny. Let's talk about the parents and Johnny. Oh, this is a good one. OK. So the parents have been noticing that Johnny's a little off. Their gut is going, woo, 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 right? Little red flag. But you don't have enough evidence to nail it to him, right? So you're doing your thing, collecting your evidence, and finally, you're like, OK, we're going to talk to Johnny tonight. That's what we're doing, right? OK, fantastic. Way to go, parents. So the parents approach Johnny, and they go, Johnny, sweetheart, we love you. Mama loves you. You can tell us anything. There is nothing you could say to me that would make me not love you. I know. We're all smiling because we've said this, right? Then Johnny, you know, um, who, whether a child, a preteen, or an adolescent, does not have a fully formed frontal lobe yet, which means big, overwhelming, emotional things, he has to learn how to deal with them. OK. But for the fun of it, let's just say Johnny's 13. I don't know. Let's split the difference. OK. So they go, Johnny, sweetheart, tell mama, right? And, and then we're coercing Johnny. Come on, Johnny, tell us. Tell us. And finally he goes, all right. Finally he buys in. And he goes, I'm angry. And we do what all well-intentioned parents do. And we go, don't you talk to me that way. This is my house. Who do you think you are, right? So in that moment, we've taught our child that if you answer my questions, I will punish you. And then we wonder why Johnny doesn't want to talk to us. We get, we're like, why, doesn't, why is he not telling me things, right? So we end up unintentionally invalidating the emotion. The emotion, you remember, is not bad. 
It's the behavior that's caused by the really big emotion. And you know, in these moments, so an affect regulation theory, right? It's the big fancy thing. But in these moments, what happens is when somebody's yelling at us and admitting this type of emotional energy, science tells us that we will replicate, right? They're in what we call the middle brain. The middle brain is where all the emotions are, right? And in that moment, it would be great, again, if Johnny could say, mother, I'm feeling angry and it's hard for me to process and I don't quite have the words to tell you how I'm feeling right now. Do you think you could teach me how to talk about it? <laughs> that would be amazing, right? I would love that. That's not happening though. So instead, we have to learn to, here's the skill, ready? Think first, freak out second. I know, these things are like game changers, right? So let me explain to you what I mean. Think first. Well, thinking requires your executive functioning. I'm not gonna go all neurobiology hardcore on you, but just saying, the front of our brain, we do problem solving, decision making, complex problem solving, emotional organization, impulse control, morals, values, beliefs. And you only get really good at it if you're female at the age of 23 or a male at the age of 26 when your frontal lobe is fully formed. And yet we want this 13 year old to know how to do this, hmm, right? So in those moments when the child goes, roar, or it could be, because sometimes this is just as scary too, maybe the child's not roaring, maybe they go all like internal and shut down, because that's scary too, right? So when that happens, we are gonna move into our front brain, literally learn how to move into our front brain, because in our front brain, we can have shame and fear because we don't know what to do. And we feel like we're failing them as the clock is ticking, but we won't get bossed around by our emotion. In your front brain, you feel the emotion, but you know, I don't have to freak out just because my emotion's saying it. So we're going to think first and freak out second. The next thing we're gonna do in this moment, this is another good one. Well, I think they're all good, but I'm biased. So we're going to be curious. I know, okay, so think about it. You're sitting across from your child and they're either like, mm, or roar, and like, my gosh, in me I go, what is going on with my kids that they are suffering that much? That's super scary, right? Scary, fear, shame. I'm not a good parent because I can't instantaneously pull the answers out from my child's soul. See, and then we get angry about it. See that? Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna be curious because I can help them learn how to say it differently once they're in their front brain. But right now, they're really overwhelmed, really emotional, they're in their middle brain and I just want to understand what's going on. So I use a why question. <laughs> Ew, gross. That's what we do and that doesn't help us be curious. Okay, you want to help me out again? Great. Not like she had a choice. Okay, <laughs> so I want you to say like, say, Jen, why did you do that? Go ahead. And then just keep asking me and just let it flow. You'll feel it. Okay. Jen, why did you do that? I don't know. Say it again. But why? Why? Because. Keep going. Because why? I don't understand why you, why you don't know why you, didn't, why you did that. Well, Johnny does it. Keep going. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, just because he does it, does that mean you do yeah. it? Oh, yes, you fell right into my trap. <laughs> Woo! Yes! Slam dunk! Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, if Johnny does it, does that mean you should do it? <laughs> Invalidate! <laughs> yeah. Right? So that's what happens. So instead of being curious, we ask why, and then it turns into, ready? I have a list of the classics. Buckle up. Just laugh about it. Don't feel shame. That's not the purpose. Okay. That shouldn't make you that upset. Oh, I love this one. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Right? Okay. Don't come to me if you screw up. You shouldn't cry over that. I don't care what your friends are doing. 
Did you actually study for that? Are you sure you're actually challenging yourself? Do you think you could do a little better? Right? We get curious, but we're not really being curious. Curiosity means that we have to sit with our own emotional intensity in that moment, the fear and the what? Shame. Oh, that was pretty good, ready? The fear and the? Shame. At home, they're probably like, come on, people, from the gut. <laughs> Um, so we have to be able to recognize that fear and the shame because that's what, and then the anger hits, right? And that's why we go, if your friends, blah, 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 would you do it too? So instead of asking why questions and saying these habitual invalidating comments, what we want to do is ask, ready? Here it goes, big game changer again. I know, I love it. When I do these moments, right, you feel the climax coming and then I see people grab their pen and their phone and they're like, say it, Jen Ben. Change my life. I am ready to have my life change. You are going to ask what and how questions. Okay, ready? So I say to the kid, no, no, I'll, I'll be the parent, you be the kid. And I go, oh my God, what's going on? I don't know. Oh, and I love that she said that. Because listen, you know how we have habits of asking why questions, right? Our kids have habits of going, I don't know, but you're going to get quiet and just sit in it because they're going to, their brain, you're going to be pulling them into their front brain. And then even though they don't know initially, you just sit in it, sit in it, you're patient, you're patient. There's no rush. And then before you know it, like three seconds later, because you didn't start talking, they talk. Ready? Watch. It kind of looks something like this. My gosh, what's going on? I See? Know. Yeah. Oh, sad. Oh my <laughs> gosh. I see that. You look so upset. How come you're feeling so upset? I cried at school today. Oh my <laughs> gosh. You know, now inside of me, I'm going, yeah, for the 155th time. <laughs> of course you did, right? But she's not in her front brain. She's in her middle brain right now. And you can't improve the skill set that's missing until they're in their front brain, right? You got to first teach them how to regulate. You got to validate the emotion, right? So we got to be curious and ask how and what questions, OK? Yes, touch your nose if it makes sense. Ooh. I was going to say, I'm watching. OK. I got another good one. I got another good one. OK, ready? So the difficult nature of parenting. What this usually also results in, in this critical world, is we want to be validated. And we want approval for the choices we're making. Because of our shame and our and you see I switched that up and it messed people up. Okay, fear and shame. We're getting better. So what we do in order to manage that is we make sure we call somebody that will lie to us and say what we did was okay. <laughs> right? So, I know, it's like slow on the uptake there, but we got it. Okay, right? So I have my, you know, my two people that I can call. And I go, yeah, and I blah, blah, blah. And they're like, good for you. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're probably on the other side going, oh, God, there goes Jen again, right? Um, <laughs> or after they lie to us and tell us we did good, you know, because we want to feel better about ourselves. Did you see blah, blah, blah on Facebook? Yeah, totally a better parent than she is. Did you see what da-da-da at the softball field? Blah, 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 blah. Right? So... <laughs> We start talking about other people. We judge what we see. Or we go, well, if my spouse wasn't such an idiot, then this wouldn't even happen. <laughs> right? Or, you know, depending on how much therapy we have, well, it's really my parents' fault. You know, <laughs> when I was a small child, that's what my therapist told me. So I really don't have any responsibility for this at all. So <laughs> I cracked myself up. OK. And, and the interesting part is, we're doing this, right? And kids are like sponges at all ages. 
And then we get upset when our kids can't magically, you know, learn how to problem solve, magically ac accept their unbearable feelings, magically know how to work through their emotions, right? So when we need validation and approval, we go get somebody to lie to us, we go judge people, we talk about them, we scroll on social media and compare ourselves and try to find somebody who we think is probably more messed up than we are, or like, that's totally fake. They're really not that happy. There's no way. My life's totally better than theirs. See that? You see that? That's not real. So, so what we have to do, here comes the skill. I love it. People are like, Freddie, I've got you trained, right? We have to be pragmatic. Okay, I know that's a big word. So we have to stop thinking that people should be able to do things that we can't do ourselves, especially our children that don't have a fully formed frontal lobe who haven't been taught things. So let me give you like a mild example. I'm in Giant going grocery shopping and my child says to me, oh, there's my friend. I go, where? She goes, over there. And I do what my father said to me. Go say hi to her. She goes, I can't do that. And I go, yeah, just go, go over there, right? Now, things have changed a little in the last 20 or 30 years. You know, we really don't just go up to each other and talk. We really don't, right? Like, it's to the point, like, I have one friend, when she, she's scheduled to come to my house, but when she shows up, she texts me in the driveway and says, I'm here. So one time I said, oh, good, I put the Rottweiler away. Like, I was like, I wanted to be like, duh. <laughs> right? So in that moment, I said, ooh, I must be more pragmatic and use a skill. Because I have to practice what I preach. And I realized... She didn't know how to, in a public place, approach somebody she knows and say hi to her and deal with the emotional awkwardness, right? She didn't know how to do that. And I don't know if I had showed her. So I said, all right. I said, it's time for Jen Ben. So I go, come on, sweetheart. And I go, hi, I'm Jen. My daughter says she's friends with your daughter from school. And I thought it'd be really great for me to model for her how to go up to somebody and say hi in the grocery store. <laughs> and the mom goes, oh, that's so awesome. And I go, I know. Look, watch, honey. It's so nice to meet you. <laughs> My poor kid, fingers crossed, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I realized, you know, if I want my kid to know how to validate herself, I have to start modeling that I do it for myself. Instead of going, oh, I can't believe that, blah, 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 right? I have to say, wow, that was great. I'm getting there, right? I have to model that. On top of which, like 90% of what kids pick up from us is nonverbal. So if you're like, I'm fine, everything's fine, they know we're lying. They don't believe us. I know. OK. Or if we want our kid to, it, oh, this is a big one. I'm watching the clock because I know you just want more. Compliments, right? My boss gives me a compliment, and I go, eh, right? And I have to go, OK, thank you. Right? Because we all like getting compliments. We don't poo-poo them ever. Or say, oh, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. When we should go, thank you. <laughs> right? Right? Right here. Watch. Watch. Ready? Tell me this dress looks amazing. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. This dress looks amazing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Eye contact. Standing up straight. Right? Look at that. Right? Uh, right? So if I wanted to evoke awkwardness in one of you with my magic powers, psh, I would just give you a compliment and I would tear you down. Right? So if we want our kids to know how to accept a compliment, right? Because someone goes, oh, you look so pretty. And our kid goes like this. And we go, say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.
they're giving you a compliment. <laughs> oh, I have no idea why they hate compliments. We're just punishing them every time, right? I know, if only to be in my brain, right? So, um, or, you know, how about the pragmatism of like learning how to celebrate your effort and progress? So what we like to do is, okay, I'm almost there. Let me make a new goal. Okay, I achieved it. Let me make a new goal and another goal and another goal. And then we go, well, you tried. You should celebrate that. You should give yourself a high five. That was great. But meanwhile, they see us going, new goal, new goal, new goal. And we wonder why they can't do that. They can't do it because we're not modeling it. And it's Bandora's modeling theory. See, I'm throwing in the intellectual parts here. Okay. Um, oh, ooh. Oh, hot topic. Ready? I'm doing it. I'm going there. Because I'm brave. Okay. How about... Mm -hmm, Get off the electronics. You're on them all day. Yeah, you all know what I'm about to say, right? I just don't understand why they can't just put it down and go entertain themselves. Hmm. Wonder why that is. Hmm. Yeah, because I know the upgrade on the Apple phone now tells you how often you're on your phone. Yeah, and I won't shame you by making you put it out and hold it up. <laughs> but I'm letting you know that I know already, OK? So if we want our children to learn how to unplug, it's like my favorite thing when people come into therapy and they're like, OK, Jen Ben, we need a detox from the electronics. And I go, all right, hand me your phone. And they go, whoa, <laughs> whoa, I need my phone. For what? Well, I'm an adult, and I should be allowed to, blah, 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 blah. And I go, yeah, well, it's not 1950 anymore, and it doesn't work that way. So if you want to detox, you're detoxing too, bucko, right? <laughs> so if we want our children to learn how to tr unplug and then go entertain themselves, this is actually a skill set, right? But prior to there being instant gratification in technology, we didn't really understand that we actually knew how to, like, I have nothing to do. Let me go play Monopoly for five hours, right? Or, wow, a stick. <laughs> you know, and then we can entertain ourselves <laughs> forever, right? So we have to be able to model this. So part of another skill I'll put right in there is all of a sudden, for 10 minutes, undisturbed, put your phone down and go play with your kid for 10 minutes. I don't care how old they are. 10 minutes. There is research that 10 minutes of play, undisturbed, is a game changer. And I tell parents, literally, put a timer on your phone. Don't have guilt when the timer goes off. And you tell your kid up front, hey, do you want to play together for 10 minutes? <laughs> My daughter's like, yes, yes, mommy, yes. Right? She's so excited. And then the timer goes off, and she's like, <laughs> and I go, I got to go. I got important <laughs> things to do. And I go, sit on the couch. And I go, really important. She goes, what are you doing? Watching a game. Really? Because the TV's on, and the microwave's going, and the music's on. I know that's your father. Right? Ten minutes of play. I'm telling you. And it goes really fast when you start doing it, right? So that's a good one. How are you doing? Oh, I got seven minutes left. I'm going to like rock your world. Ooh, yes. I save a good one for last. I know. It has to, I told you you were going to want more. It's sad, isn't it? But you could sign up for parent group. You could say, Jen, I'm going to your parent group. Change my life, right? OK. So I would like to talk about that demon from the abyss that we all have, that we unleash. When our shame and fear is at its highest, and then the anger hits, and we go, I am going to win this battle <laughs> by unleashing the demon. 
because winning is the only thing that matters in this moment. So I'm in the car with my child. And, you know, and it was so important. I can never remember what it's about. Have you noticed that? <laughs> All these things that we like freak out and let our emotion run the show. And then later people come into therapy and they go, I don't even know what it was about, but blah, blah, blah happened. And I did this and I don't think it was good. <laughs> and I go, I agree. That's great insight, right? So we're in the car, you know, and she's doing her, ah! and I just don't. I just don't have it left in me, right? And I go, come on, you know, get it together, blah, blah, blah. And I'm trying to be, I'm like, use a skill, use a skill. And she's pushing back, right? <laughs> and then we got in the driveway. We made it all the way home, right? 20-minute car ride. I'm like, no, and I was like, get in the driveway. And then something in my middle brain says, unleash the demon. <laughs> so I put the car in park and I turn around and I go, no electronics for the rest of your life. <laughs> it works so good. I keep doing it. Right? So, so I, yeah, I realized that that happens once in a while, you know, because I'm not perfect. So I know you can't be, right? So I'm not asking you to be perfect. But I, so this skill, this is like a personal favorite, this name I came up with. I call it shoving your hand in the hornet's nest, right? So imagine I have a hornet's nest hanging here. And it's like for some reason, as parents, we walk up to the hornet's nest and we go, I'm going to shove my hand in there <laughs> and I'm not going to get stung. No, that's what we do in these situations, right? But it's totally going to be worth it. And then we go, ah! So in that moment, I went, no, electronics for the rest of your life. And it was like, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, the gasp of air. You know, and the only reason why I won for three seconds was because she was doing an almighty inhale to like, you know, respond, right? Emotion regulation theory, right? I'm letting out the demon. So guess what that causes our child to do? Take a wild guess. Unleash their demon. <laughs> and for some reason, we think it won't. But there is science now to prove if we unleash our demon, the other person is very likely to unleash theirs. So it actually doesn't work. But we do it a lot. Um, so what we have to do is start remembering what our hornet's nests are. And stop shoving your hand in the hornet's nest and being surprised that you get stung. I know it seems like common sense, but we do it. We just go shove it right in there, right? OK. So we have gone over eight skills today, right? So just for everybody to hear them, because I care. We're going to see the effort, right? Start acknowledging progress and effort, but work on it in yourself first. Then you can tr transition that skill more easily. We want to learn to be more precise. Instead of using words like always and never, be more accurate. Sometimes, frequently. You know, sometimes you ground me and sometimes you don't. Funny, but wouldn't that be nice? Because then you could go, that's true. Then we want to be able to connect and then correct. Oh, yes. Whoever that was, I like it. I like that. He's feeling it. He's feeling it. See, that happens. You just want to like, yes, Jen. OK. Then we want to be able to think first and freak out second. So we're going to move into our front brain. Because the secret is, if you move into your front brain, you don't have to freak out. That's why I say freak out second. Right? Sometimes I say to my daughter, she goes, I know, mommy. I'm about to say, think first. She goes, think first, freak out second. But I found that was a little hard for her, so I changed it to ask me a question first and then freak out. Because to ask questions uses what? You, yeah, executive functioning. You got to use your front brain. Complex problem solving and decision making. Ooh, sneaky. I am sneaky, right? Then we want to be able to be curious. And we do this by asking what and how questions. We want to be pragmatic. 
If there's something you want your child to learn how to do, learn how to do it yourself first so you can model it. Modeling is a really quick way for children to absorb how to do things. And we added in the 10 minutes of play, right? That learning to unplug and entertain yourself. 10 minutes of play, set the clock. And then the last one is, don't shove your hand in the hornet's nest and get surprised that you get stung. Because you wouldn't do it in real life, right? So if you picked up on it, what we've been talking about today is to manage parenting in a critical world where we have emotions and society is fast paced and judgmental, we have to be able to look at what we're doing, stop the shame and the embarrassment from running us, and just start working on it. Because we don't have to be perfect. We but if we're not willing to look at ourselves and work on ourselves, then the message we're really sending is, we have to be perfect and it's too hard, so I'm not gonna work on it. And then we go, but you have to be perfect. <laughs> so we wanna be able to practice it. And here's the other part that I have found, that I became a much more humble parent, believe it or not, even though I think I'm amazing. Once I started practicing these skills for myself, because I started to realize with a fully formed frontal lobe how difficult change really is. And it started to really help me see my child in a more empathetic way when I was sick and tired of them not putting their shoes on or sick and tired of the room being dirty or sick and tired of them not responding or sick and, I mean, right? This is what happens. And we all have a lot to do, but learning how to put a little extra effort in with ourselves can actually make it more doable. So I had a couple goals for us tonight. Oh my God, did you see that? One hour precisely, what? Right? I had a couple goals for us tonight. So the first one was I wanted to increase the awareness of how this criticalness plays out unintentionally when we're parenting. Did we do that tonight? Yes? Can I get a yes? yes? Ooh, okay. And I wanted to work on helping you see it so you could accept that it is happening for you and you don't have to feel shame about it. Did we do that? Yes. Oh, thank you. Okay. And I wanted you to walk away with some actionable steps. Did that happen? Yes! yes. yes. Ooh, that's so good. Okay. So, I um, told them, you know, I know some people, because we're all on schedules here, might have to excuse themselves, but I, I told them I'd be willing to stay up to a half hour if people had questions about what we discussed this evening. So if you have questions, you can raise your hand. I'd be glad to answer them. If not, that's all right. Yep. Yes. Yes, that's a great question. So the first thing I had to think about when I was trying not to shove my hand in the hornet's nest was what are the things I'm usually shoving my hand in the hornet's nest about, right? So I realized um, when I felt like I didn't know how to make her stop, right? In that moment where I was like, what do I do? I don't know how to make her stop having emotion. And I felt really out of control. And I also realized I usually would get the urge to take things away forever or for like a month. And I knew these were things that I wouldn't ever follow through on. So the one thing I really like about your question, and for those of you at home, the question, just so I make sure you know, was tips to not shove your hand in the hornet's nest. Okay. Um, we can't change what we're unaware of. I know, it's like I have a book of common sense or something, isn't it? Is this good? I know. You can't, and yet we try to do it all the time. So we have to increase our awareness about our specific patterns, right? Because yours and yours and yours might be a little different. So it's, instead of waiting till the moment when you're shoving your hand in the hornet's nest, you have to start thinking ahead of time, is there certain people that I shove my hand in the hornet's nest? Certain situations, right? A really common one for some parents is, their child talking back in public, right? And so, you know, like I was at my daughter's basketball game and 
she got really dysregulated because her coat fell on the floor. But did I mention she was in the game? So all of a sudden, in the middle of the game, she goes, and I was a basketball player. So I was like, the demon was like, let me out. I will correct her. So she's walking up and down the court like this, literally. <laughs> I mean, she's not even making it. She's just going back and forth in the middle of the court. She's not even making it to one end or the other. And I'm like, what's going on, right? And she's like, da, 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 da. and I have no idea what she's saying. And, I, and so I felt embarrassed, right? Because my kid is on the court, and they're not doing their job, right? So I started to feel panicked, fear. And then, because I, as a parent, don't like feeling fear and panic and shame, I get angry about it, right? So I, I realized a long time ago that when she wasn't doing what I fantasized she should be doing in public, I get, hmm, I appreciate that giggle. That means you're validating me. Thank you for the validation. Um, I realized that that is a moment where I tend to shove my hand in the hornet's nest, right? And so I, um, she came off the court and she was like, my jacket's on the floor and it's dirty. Like, I mean, up in my face, right? And, and the old me would have been like, do not talk to me that way. Who do you think you are? But, you know, I realized because I had to think about this. I was like, why do I get so embarrassed that my kid's doing this in public? Like, why, why does that make me a bad parent? Everybody else's kid is doing the same thing. It's not just mine. And then I was like, well, they don't pay my bills. Hmm. I guess I don't have to care what they think then. But if you pay my bills, if anybody would like to pay my bills, <laughs> you can tell me what you think as much as you'd like to and whatever you'd like to say about me, even though I'm sure it will be magical. Um, so I would have you outside of the moment, right? Think about where does shame, embarrassment, fear get evoked in you as a parent, right? Um, what are certain things that are the most paralyzing for you? And that tends to be the situations we shove our hand in the hornet's nest. Is that helpful or not helpful? Ooh. Yeah. So you know what? That's such a great question. And that brings in like a whole behaviorism thing, which we spend three weeks on in parenting group. So um, if you email me, yes, I'd be glad to send you more information and get you all signed up because we accept insurance. I know everybody's like, get her email address now. OK. Other questions? Hmm. Mm. He hit a rock bottom over the past few months with what I call too much disharmony in our home. Yeah. And it's really because I feel like a broken tape recorder and how many times, we're all busy, right? Mm. How many times do I have to say what's expected as far as responsibilities in your house and mm -hmm. responsibilities as a student? Yeah. Like I have responsibilities to our house and I have mm -hmm. responsibilities as my job. Mm -hmm. Like being a student is their job. Right. So I got tired of all this disharmony. It was just, it was not, not healthy to be yeah. screaming and just never on the same page. So I came up with um, an idea where I had something taped on our pantry. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like elementary, really, but it's working. So I thought I'd share it. So I basically wrote up a contract. I wrote down everything that is expected of mm. them. Yeah. And I made them read it, sign it. Nice. So when something creates disharmony, by the way, the contract is this is what is required to create harmony in our household. Hmm. And then when something is created that disrupts that, mm -hmm. and they decide they want to argue it, mm -hmm. let's take a walk down and look at the pantry. You signed this. Reread the sentence. Mm -hmm. This is what you're struggling with right now. You must have forgotten what you agreed on when you signed it. Mm -hmm. It's going well. Can we snap it up? Just an idea. <laughs> no, let's, let's snap it up. She's like... I like it. Like, how often do we go like, I'm amazing. <laughs> now, if you're in my family, I do this all the time. But we don't usually do that, right? Because we don't celebrate, right? So, um, I'm saying I'm amazing, but it has made a difference. 
tired. Yeah, so. I'm tired of repeating myself. Yeah, and there's a couple. I'm treating them like little kids. Yeah, and there's a couple pieces to that that I like, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, but, but this, is what, this is what's really interesting about it. She said, that's it. What I'm doing is not working. That is brilliant. That's brilliant. Because usually you go, it's not working. I better do it more. <laughs> and instead she goes, it's not working. I'm going to take a risk and do something different as a parent. That's great. Why not, right? And really what I hear is she developed a language for her family. Now, what she's doing might not work for everybody's family, and that's all right. But what she did was she took the 800-pound albino gorilla in the house and said, we are going to learn how to talk about this 800-pound gorilla, right? And when her kids are going, because... They're kids, they don't want to do it. She found a way to go, I hear you, and look, remember we talked about this, right? That's excellent, and it's different for everybody's family, but I think there's a lot of key things there that you were able to do. Yeah, other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so how do we measure progress? So the one thing is, if anybody in here has more than one kid, you'll know that each kid is completely different from the other one, yep. right? So if you have more than one, you know this. <laughs> and so I think the first thing is, like one, we have to not measure our progress against other people's families, and then I do believe that families have morals and values and beliefs that they place in their household, which is really important, um, and that there's some standard expectations. But every child's ability to emotionally regulate or tolerate distress or to um, be successful academically is different, right? And so I think part of measuring success is Again, outside of the moment, you and your significant other or a friend or somebody you trust being able to sit down and like, when's the last time we had a five minute conversation about Sally and said, hey, so I know this is what we see Sally's potential as, right? And this is where we think Sally is. So how do we get her to here? Or what would it look like if she was a two instead of a one? And then we start figuring out what that is. So when it happens, we know how to promote it, right? So I think a lot of times part of the challenge is because you said it, it's busy, we got things to do, places to go. It's hard to have that five minute conversation, especially like how many times in modern society is it like, okay, you're it, I gotta go, right? There's something in the microwave, I think it's popcorn, feed them. Right? I mean, that happens all the time. And the other thing I would say is that we actually spend two weeks on it in parenting groups. <laughs> I think of it all. Yeah, other questions? Yes? We have, uh, oh, God bless you. <laughs> Right. And other times it's like, and, and I, and I mm -hmm. go right to attack one. And I, I think it's like self regulation on myself. Where do you, what's, what's a good process to just pause mm -hmm. for a second and, and go through? Yeah, so um, if I had an hour, I would teach you a whole skill set. Um, so you're talking about emotion regulation. So I think, again, the first part in emotion regulation is starting to learn and understand that there are more emotions than mad, sad, and glad. 
which is usually what we only teach. I actually have this really magical sheet that has like 500 emotions on it. And people go, oh my gosh, that's a lot of emotions. And I go, yes, which one are you? And they're like, uh, oh, sad? And I'm like, no, how did you pick sad out of all those? <laughs> how did that just happen? <laughs> right? So um, what we have to start to do, like part of emotion regulation, one is identifying emotion. And two, every emotion has a habitual physiological response. So when we're sad, we breathe a certain way, our blood pressures a certain way, our heart rate, our muscle tension. Um, we might feel it in a certain part of our body, but we do so much in life unconsciously, you know, or without thoughtfulness. So it's very possible your demons have been brewing, right? And, um, but we weren't paying attention to the signs, right? So they're actually, usually when people slow down and start to think about their situations where they shove their hand in the hornet nest, they start to realize like, oh, you know what? I actually do that when I get disgusted with my spouse, right? And then you start to learn what disgust you think about. Well, how do I know I'm disgusted? And these are things we don't talk about in society, right? Right? right. Oh, thank you, sorry. I was like, wait, where'd everybody go? Um, so we have to start being aware of like being able to identify, understand the physiological sensations happening. But there's this whole other part to emotion regulation where, do you ever feel like some days you're just more vulnerable to emotion than others? There's actually something called emotional vulnerability. It's a real thing. So they have found that there are things in the past that can make us vulnerable, or there could be things in the present moment. And it's really amazing how powerful it could be so you come in the door from work, and the kids, like, you know, like lemur monkeys come over and they're like, Daddy, right? And they're climbing on you. But we have to know, like, instead of just getting out of the car, walking in thoughtlessly, right? Like, how about you pull in the driveway, you go, OK, I'm going to walk into the house. And the lemur monkeys are going to climb on me like I am a tree. <laughs> and I'm feeling very angry about my boss. I'm very vulnerable right now. It's a chance I won't want them touching me. <laughs> you know, I mean, do we stop to do that, right? No. And so the, you know, the quickest response I can give you is emotion regulation is doable. It does require us, you know, sometimes it's just increasing our awareness and learning what it feels like in our body. Um, and also because every emotion has a habitual breathing pattern connected to it, you can actually, if you start to focus on, like we all have like those Fitbits and like smart watches, right? You actually can learn how to pair your respiration or heart rate with emotions. So you could be a little data driven, right? And do a little like data check, whoa. <laughs> I'm either shamed or terrified. <laughs> Probably both, because I'm home. <laughs> right? And then your wife texts you, and then it goes up to 200, and you go, oh my God. No. Yeah, so just starting to recognize it and be aware of it and know your vulnerabilities is a really great step. But there are lots of things you could do, and we spent two weeks on it in parent group. <laughs> I know, right? Any other questions? Yes. What do you do if you are a little has the healthcare mentality, even if you are uh, um, recognizing the effort, she would say, I don't care, I don't care. And she hates you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds like you're doing it right if she hates you. Come on. Duh. Right. OK. So I like this question. So she's saying, you know, I'm trying to acknowledge my child. And she goes, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. And I hate you, too. <laughs> like, ooh, tell me something I don't know. Sometimes I'm like, oh, wait, you don't care? Ooh, I'm totally shocked. OK. Um, so I think about this idea of 
So a lot of times, right, if I walk up to somebody and I go, here, this is for you, and they go, I don't want that. You go, fine. I didn't. I'm going to give it to you anyways. <laughs> right? And that's usually how we interact in relationships, right? If someone doesn't present as grateful, we go, taking it back. And I'm never offering it to you again, right? Even if we don't try to do that on purpose, right? Again, now we know, because you've been to this one hour talk, that our nonverbals speak very loudly, right? So when I get parents who come in and talk about what you're discussing, we practice this idea of leaving it on the table, right? So, you know, maybe you notice um, she's upset or maybe she did something well, right? And you just go up to her and like, hey, you know, you know, what's going on? You look, see how what questions? What's going on? You look upset. And she goes, I don't want to talk to you. I hate you. <laughs> and you go, Well, I I'm just gonna be in the kitchen doing some dishes. If you decide you want to talk about it, let me know. Right? So instead of going, why do you always, they're like, oh, right, oh, right? I mean, I don't know what happens, right? But I can't imagine, right? Because usually when people are like, I don't like you, I don't go, aw. <laughs> yes, right? Because affect regulation theory tells us that if we go, people go, right? Like if I want to make you smile, I just walk up to you and go, hi. And you'll smile because I'm like making that happen. I have control, magic powers. Right? So you want to learn how to, if we know that's what happens a lot, we got to stop being surprised that she goes, and I don't like you. Right? Because we know that. She knows, we know they don't like us. So, we, so instead of when they do that, we just go, well, I'm going to be in there. So if you want to talk later, just let me know. And we go do it. And it's like, hey, here's some dinner. I've been really worried about you, you know. You look upset. I told you, I don't want to talk about it, and I hate your face. <laughs> and you go, can you pass me the salt and pepper? <laughs> right? I mean, it's, to me, I, the thing I really appreciate about your example, like, one, it's so humbling because I've been there, um, and two, that to me is the perfect example that evokes shame and fear in us as parents, right? And then we get angry about the shame and the fear. And that's when we go, hmm, taking it back, right? And so we want to learn how to leave stuff on the table and sit in our emotion, right? Because we want to show our kids that we'll follow them to the ends of the earth. There's nothing they can do to shake us, even if they say they hate our guts. We still are there. Great question. Any other questions? Yes. Um, what are you trying to do that for? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you, because I know everybody else is thinking it. So Parent Group is actually opening up again. I think it's five weeks we're starting another group. Um, so if you are interested, email me, and then I'll send you everybody. I give them some initial information because it's parent group. It's really important that it's a safe place, but we can learn. And so I let everybody know up front what to expect, what it's going to look like. It's not a process group, so people are not coming in and giving their own individual examples. I always say at the beginning group, believe it or not, people don't want to hear you talk. They want me to talk, right? So, and we're focusing on understanding, like being aware of what's going on, teaching you the psychoeducation, helping you accept how it's playing out for you, and then teaching you what to do. It's very um, psychoeducational and skills focused. And then you get a little bit of homework that's super doable, and then you come back and I give corrective feedback to everybody. And it's a very caring environment, but we also keep it safe. And we're not allowed to talk to each other in group because everybody wants to hear me talk and not them. So just email me. Any other questions? Business cards? I can't see your email. Oh, well, yeah, my email. Yes. 
is J-E-N-B-E-N, Jen Ben Consulting at gmail.com. Nope, all lowercase. Yep. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No? Okay. Oh, yes. Is it a um, it's on the website right now, um, and I don't know, um, Pat is the PR person put it up there, I don't know when she said it to expire, but if you go there now and get the link, it will be on YouTube, you know, potentially, or if you, or if you just search it on YouTube. Okay. So for those of you at home, if you'd like to rewatch this, copy and paste that link somewhere safe. <laughs> so thank you so much for having me out and, uh, you know, allowing me to give you 30% of my wisdom. And everybody have a safe trip home, you know, as those rainy roads, okay? Thank you. All right.